Howdy, it's Tubal Cain again, and uh, today's video is going to be on uh, casting out of uh, molten metal these little flywheels for my engines. Bef but before I start, just a word of thanks to a, a Mr. Caspin who sent me this uh, long angle lathe file. And in one of my uh, videos, I think it was uh, philosophy, philosophy, I just mentioned that I used to use these long angle files in the school shop and I, d I did not own any so he sent me one uh, and uh, thank you and notice the difference this is just a standard mill file here on the left the angle of the teeth and uh, they cut much more rapidly and work uh, very well on a lathe made specifically for that purpose and at the high school I had them painted yellow I painted this one red so I can quickly identify it so if you ever see me using this red one and uh, make sure you have a, a handle on it. I had to put that handle on. Now, at school it just didn't work out at all because the, the kids, uh, you know, a file to them is a file. So I finally gave up on that. But uh, mainly they wanted to use them as uh, badminton rackets to hit rivets across the room. I recently did a series on... Uh, flywheels and how to drill a bolt circle or a hole circle that was four or five videos and right away of course I was criticized somebody said I like the spoked ones better well I do too but I realized that there's probably only three guys in the world that have made their own mold try not to brag on that but uh, and I know you're not going to do it or can't do it and you're going to have to use the other type of flywheel that I showed you that's why I, I spent uh, so much time and did five videos on it but these little uh, these are cast out of hard lead and on all of my engines you're gonna see and I had two sizes of them you're gonna see these little lead flywheels that's been painted gold of course usually I paint them paint them and then I machine them so you don't have to mask them but lately I've been making engines in this size and that's a little bit smaller and uh, sometimes I turn them down on the lathe so they appear even smaller but that came out of the same mold and that's what they look like it's just like casting sinkers cut that sprue off of there and uh, machine it or some I've even used without machining because uh, you'll see in a second here that I now cast that hole in there so they run pretty true without even machining them This is the larger of the two molds, made of aluminum, half inch thick aluminum, and these were made on that rotary table that you might have seen in some of my other videos. And that's the size right there. However, on this one, I had no provision for casting that center hole. And there's some of my original dimensions there from when I had it on the uh, milling machine and I'm surprised that those didn't burn off that magic marker but uh, I made some improvements in the other one which I'm going to show you here momentarily uh, you know you it's a there's a growing uh, a learning curve I was going to say these little slots here that you see are made for putting a screwdriver in there to pry the two halves apart because sometimes it's kind of tricky to get them apart these are the uh, alignment pins the male part and the female. This is like injection molding in a factory with plastic or with zinc. And they used to call it die cast, but I'm doing it strictly by gravity. And speaking of gravity, in this one, what I did here, I repositioned this within the blank so I would have a little bit more of a head here. That is, a little, that weight there I thought gave me a little bit more pressure down into the mold and uh, had a little bit better uh, castings because of that. The larger holes here are from holding it down onto the rotary table. And again, there's the alignment pins. Here's my little grooves to pry it apart. You can see the screwdriver marks on them. And on this one, take a look. This is a tapered pin. A tapered pin. Let's see. Got to go out this way. A tapered machine pin of a standard size, and I had a reamer for that. 
So when I was uh, machining this, what I did, and this took an awful lot of time to, to make this. I think some of you can imagine the, uh, how much time it took. But what I do is I put the tapered pin in there. This is the big side of the hole. This is a big hole. That's a small hole because it was reamed. It, again, it was reamed. So I just put that in there, tap it ever so lightly, and then when the metal solidifies, hardens, doesn't dry. Kids always wanted to say, is my mold dry? I hold this in the vise when I'm uh, pouring. And then when I'm ready to take it out, I, first thing I do is tap the pin out of there. And that gives me a nice hole. Although I will later ream that 3 sixteenths or whatever size I want because the hole in the finished casting, of course, is tapered as well. So this is the mold I'm going to use for the smaller ones because I still have plenty of the big uh, flywheels in stock. I have no need for them, so I'd like to make up about 10 of these and that'll last me several years. As a matter of fact, it's been several years since I did this, so again, i got to relearn some of the things as I do this. And not everyone comes out uh, perfect. You know, I'm going to have some short runs and, and some bad ones or some that won't come out and they get warped when I do take them out. And... Uh, uh, I just melt them down so it's no big deal. But until I get the temperature regulated on everything, that is uh, the mold up to the right heat uh, so that uh, the metal won't chill off before it fills it, and uh, the same token, I don't want the, the mold too hot or it will not uh, harden in time. And then I take it, uh, I open it up, and the, the uh, material is still slushy and immediately breaks up like, uh, like fudge. So um, I'm going to go out in the garage here in a minute. We've got a warm day, so it'll be, I don't like to do this in the basement because of the smell. And uh, I'm going to show you all the different uh, tools I use out there and uh, for my melting. And it's just a little plumber's furnace that I use. But just about, you could do this on the kitchen stove if your wife would tolerate it in the kitchen. And I know she will not. But you might find this of interest, even though it's something you will never do. And it's a lot like uh, casting sinkers. Now, sometimes I have trouble getting it out of the mold, as I just said. So later I'm going to perform an experiment, and I might put some lamp black on there to see if that helps as a parting agent. But I do not spray or put anything on there as a, as a parting agent. Now, it is not possible to pour aluminum or brass or anything else in here. It has to be lead, and I use what I call hard lead. And the hard lead source that I use is wheel weights from a car. They have antimony in them and uh, they're, they're kind of brittle and hard and that's what I want to use. I also use some type lead from printers and not too much of that is available anymore. And now here in Illinois and I think in other states they also have banned uh, lead from wheel weights and they're making them out of zinc or something else. I'm not sure what but you know will the tree huggers be the death of us and the EPA rule the entire world? I'll meet you out in the garage. I'm in the garage now and I think as long as I've digressed a little bit uh, and I am probably showing slight anger toward uh, authorities but uh, here are the wheel weights and I just broke this one in half in a vise just to show you that it's brittle. And that's the kind of lead I want. I don't want lead like a solder, you know, that you can tie in a knot. And here also are some printer slugs. This came off a linotype machine. I bet half the people watching this never heard of the Mergenthaler linotype. The man went insane when he invented that machine. It was so intricate. Now this would also be brittle. It will not bend but it will break if I put it in the vise and you know I just went to a two months ago I was at a wedding reception ooh the boat is rocking and I met a man there that I uh, lives in Chicago and I hadn't seen him in a while but he spent this he's 75 he spent his whole life in the printing industry and a good part of it was running a linotype and I said well how is your health Bill uh, I said, what with you having been over uh, a lead pot, a molten lead smoldering most of your life? He said, I'm fine. That didn't phase me. He said, I got another friend. He's 90 now. That he. Uh, uh, so these guys worked around lead. I'm not saying lead isn't dangerous. I, I'm not saying that at all. And, uh, you know, but uh, 
Oh, never mind. You know what I mean. But this is my source of lead. And here's my little furnace. And I told you that's a plumber's furnace. And I already got that charged. And by the way, these, uh, these steel clips will float to the top. Yes, steel floats in lead. And I will skim those off. And that'll take about 15 minutes to come up to heat. And I'll add more of it. I generally keep a couple pieces on the hearth here that'll kind of preheat. So when I do put them in there, it, uh, it won't... Uh, be a problem and I add lead constantly every few flywheels I make that chills the metal because I don't want the metal getting too hot it's really a uh, just guessing so that I have it the right temperature but I also turn the flame down a little bit and it's a propane fired uh, lead pot because I think that plumbers used to take uh, one of these into the foundation of the house or in the basement of the house when they were pouring lead before the days of plastic pipe. So I got this thing super cheap. Now I got a nice maple workbench there. I do not want to get burnt spots on it. I just got that last year. So I'm working on my welding, my portable welding card here made of steel. I'm probably rambling a little bit uh, here. I know I am, but my dross and my uh, waste will go in this old Folgers coffee can here when they still made them out of steel, you know. Can't get those anymore. I will preheat this by laying it on top of the of the pot also a little bit, just to get it good and warm. Now let me talk a little bit about how I dress when I do this. I will wear gloves. I will wear that face shield you see back there and I got long sleeves on because just in case we have a little sputtering and it lands on my arms, you know, it really won't hurt. This lead melts at about 600 degrees, you know, someplace in that uh, that area. Now, let me caution you that the main thing to think about when pouring metal or having molten metal is there should be absolutely no water around there. Never cool your mold in water because there might be some remaining in there and the second you pour hot lead into a, a mold that has some water in it, it will turn to steam and you got Mount Vesuvius instantly. So uh, be careful of that. Uh, absolutely no water in the area. What I like to do to cool my mold a little bit when it gets too hot, because this will get too hot for me. I'd like to reduce the temperature by say 200 degrees. This is a block of copper. Yeah, it's two inch thick copper. Boy, is that heavy. But when I lay the mold on there, that just sucks the heat out of there. Just about the right amount of uh, that I want to, want to get out of there. So that's my little trick that I use there. And then I will hold the uh, mold in this Wilton vise. Now as I do this, I won't be able to show you every step. I won't be able to talk because I will be busy and really need three hands for what I'm doing. So I'll try to show you as much of it as I can, but there are some parts that uh, will probably not appear on video because I'm a one-man show. I wish I had a cameraman and a lighting man and a director, but I don't. All right, I've lit the uh, furnace. You can see the flame. And uh, this is going to take a little while, so I'll get back to you when the pot is molten. Well, it's about a half hour later. And what I'm attempting to do here now is to get everything heated up. So I got the ladle in with the lead. And I've got uh, the mold sitting here in the front. Giving it the old spit test. It's all bagasse and bagash, as my old metals teacher would say. So now I'm going to get my gloves on here and I'm going to scrape off some of that dross and the metal clips. A lot of that is the steel clips that were on the wheel weights. That must have been a, a, a zinc wheel weight in there, or one that didn't melt. 
Okay, and I'll continue that until it's all nice and clean. There's the first one I poured. Now it always takes a while to get everything up to heat. Naturally, the metal didn't, this is a short shot, the metal didn't get all the way to the bottom and it wouldn't go into the spokes which are thinner. So, the metal is not hot enough, well the metal is hot enough that the mold is not hot enough. That's the real problem right now. So I'm heating it just a little bit more, but all of a sudden it'll come up to the right temperature and I'll get good casts. There's the second one and it's uh, getting a little bit better. Now I'm using a bottom pour ladle, which tends to be self-skimming. I like to pour as fast as I can. Well, I'm about four or five later, and I'm finally getting some where they're almost usable, but you can see some little cold spots there. So let's try another one, see what we get. I am not in the least discouraged because this is what I expect until you get all the heat just right. As the mold separates, and I pry it apart, the uh, casting always sticks on one side and comes out rather freely on the other side. So sometimes this is a bit of a struggle and I have to pry a little bit, trying not to damage anything. And I tap it from the back side with my plastic mallet. But of course, it's hotter than a pistol, so I got to wear gloves and it's very clumsy. I got two good ones, so I'm finally getting the, the knack of it here. There's always a learning curve, as I said before. And I, I think what I forgot to mention before with that uh, a hole that I cast in the middle. The other reason for doing that is to try to minimize the shrinkage because that's a thick spot and there's no uh, sprue or riser that is able to take the heat away from it. So uh, that has helped a lot so I don't get the shrink spots. Still trying to keep this thing warm and all this time now I only got two good ones but I think it's going to go faster now. The last one that I just did is the best one so far See a little shrinkage right there on the hub? Let's try another one. I can tell that the temperature is getting right because my leather gloves are smoking. And I can feel the heat uh, through the gloves now, which I couldn't earlier. So I think I got the knack of it now. Let's see if I can show you the demolding here. First I knock out the pin. There's the pin. Screwdriver. I put that right back on the oven to get it hot. And I'm, I'm just trying this by, uh, by banging it. came right out. Oh, I'm getting good. Please don't ask if I sell these. You can see it's way too much work. I wouldn't sell them for any less than $50 and nobody would pay $50 for one. 